Can we get, begin in about five seconds? Are you ready, Rob? But before we get to Rob... I forgot the question. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now back in business for the second session. And I guarantee you, this is the exciting part. We got some uh, goosebump stories for you. I told you that. And before we start, we got a question over here, and that leads into where's uh, uh, Scott? Was Mark? Who is it? Scott. Scott. Where's Scott? He's what are you, Scott? Okay. This man over here has a question, and that leads right into yours. So, what was your question now? How does a high efficiency furnace lower the temperature of the stack? Okay. On a high efficiency furnace, that's what the question was. How does it really work? All you need to know at this point is this. On a regular furnace, we have combustion inside of a heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger is just so big to absorb the BTUs, and of course the rest of the heat goes out the vent. But on a high efficiency furnace, we increase the size of that heat exchanger, and we actually have different tubes that the combustion gases are forced through. Now, if we can increase the size, it has more exposure time, and of course we actually blow more air across that heat exchanger, uh, to effect the absorbing of the BTU. So maybe to make it simple, it's just a larger heat exchanger and we can absorb more BTUs. But if we cool it down to that point, then of course we end up getting water <coughs> out of it. And remember, you know, again, for every pint we get almost a thousand BTUs. So Scott, right? Mm -hmm. You were gonna tell us how many pints of water, or tell us in fact how, how you were gonna say that. Oh, I, I just had drain towel put in my home. Okay. I got a 75,000 BTU ring. Furnace. Right. Okay. Sure. And the guy says, well, I'm going to put you a drain tile or this, your spigot in the floor. We don't need any of this. For the time being, I'm going to put you a five-gallon bucket underneath your drain. I figured, okay, a couple of days. I'll go down and fix it back up. Well, I came down the day afterwards. I had five gallons plus on the floor just from the furnace around the 24-hour period. So five gallons in the 24-hour period right. then. So you figure it out. How many pints are in five gallons? How many pints in a gallon? Two pints equal a quart, no, four quarts equal a gallon. What is it, eight pints a gallon? Eight pints. It'd be 40 to five gallons. 40, how many, four, uh, 40, 40 pints? 40 pints to five gallons. So almost 1,000 BTUs per pint, so that's like 40,000, right? I think that's right, isn't it? 40,000 BTUs almost? Mm -hmm. Worth of heat that would have normally gone up this chimney that you were able to put back into your house. That, that's a lot of heat, 40,000 BTUs. And then, it's, of course, we end up picking up some of the sensible heat from that, too. But it's the condensate that we can actually visually see that. Okay? So if that helps. All right. Yeah. I've got one quick question. I mean, sure. We were talking a little bit about size. You know, uh -huh. you get your certification cards and stuff through RSES or through EPA. And On the CFC cards? Right. Yeah, what, what about them? You go state to state. Are, are you grandfathered from state to state? No. You take that's, that's a good question. On CFC issues, you may be certified through RSES here, but I'll give you the, the only example that I know of that is, that, is, that is not good in Wisconsin. You cannot work in Wisconsin with a uh, CFC card from anybody else except from the, um, I guess it's the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm not sure on that, but the Wisconsin does not recognize anybody's CFC card except their own. That's you cannot right. purchase any refrigerant in Wisconsin with a CFC certification. What if I go to do work in Wisconsin? Then you have to find out how they're certified. And you'll have to be certified what in the fashion that they are. Okay? All right. Rob? <laughs> now, Rob is going to an answer the question because Rob now knows... <coughs> how to soft boil an egg. And I want you to listen to him very clearly because that's part of what we're going to talk about here. And if you want to be good at refrigeration, you must know how to soft boil an egg. Rob, tell us how to soft boil an egg. I don't know. Oh, come on! <laughs> if you had to survive, and that's all you had to eat and you wanted it soft boiled, how are you going to soft boil it? Go ahead. Leave it outside. Let it cook. No, soft boil the name. Seriously. Yeah. I don't know. Boil it. Well, but how? I mean, how many minutes, when do you put the egg in? I want you to start from scratch. You got a pot of water, you put it on the stove. Now what are you going to do? Let the water heat up first. Okay, and then what? Then put the egg, when the water boils, put the egg in. Very good. And how long will you keep it in for? On by... How many minutes? Oh, a few minutes. Okay, how many is few? Two minutes. How many? Two minutes. Okay, now listen to what he said. So let's let's take that now as the as the instructions. 
Rob says, take the pot, put it on the stove, boil the water, take the egg, put it in there for two minutes. Will it be soft boiled? It'll be, yeah, it'll be a not quieter. Right, it'll be, you'll have a lot of soft white in there too. Not a lot of soft white, but you'll have some soft white. So it's not quite soft boiled yet. So under these conditions that Rob said, take the pot, put it on the stove, boil the water first, and then put the egg in. How many minutes do you really need to have a good soft boiled egg? Three, How many minutes? Three, five. Three, five, see? That's what you need to understand. Who's cooking the egg, see? And are you really going to boil the water first and put the egg in? Or are you going to put the egg in the cold water and boil it? You see, now your time is different. Because now the egg is heating up with the water. The water is going from room temperature or actually colder to room temperature because it comes from the ground temperature. Chicago water temperature, what, 45, 50 degrees, whatever it is? And you're going to boil that water so the egg heats up with it. So if you really do put the egg in, while the water's heating up, you have to put it in for less time than if you put the egg in after it boiled because it needs more time to heat up then. Is that clear? Okay, I think. You better know how to soft boil eggs. Rob, is that okay? If we tell you now in the manner that you did it, we have to really increase it to five minutes for you, the way you said? That's fine, yeah. Would it be okay if we said that if we did it that way, leave it in for five minutes, but if you started from scratch and let the egg boil with the water, be three minute egg maybe? Yeah. That would be okay. But if he puts it in after it boils five minutes, everybody agree on that? So if we boil the water, stick the egg in, the way Rob wants, it'll be five minute egg, and be nice and soft boiled. We all agree. Now I'll guarantee you this, Rob will boil an egg here tonight, and you will never be able to eat it. Isn't that nice what, what you're learning tonight? Yeah. Huh? Just wait. We're, we are getting to it. Let's go on to no. this page. Ooh, I can't wait, right? Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to know this page. What we're saying here is that this is a column of mercury. Remember mercury, 13 and a half times as heavy as water? This, this little tube is closed at the bottom, and they're showing us over here in, in inches. We're saying that if this tube was closed, Actually, atmospheric pressure would hold a column of mercury up almost 30 inches high. And remember, if it's 29.92 inches, it's almost 30 inches, and if it's 13 and a half times as heavy as water, now you understand why water would be three and a half stories high, okay? So the point is that uh, at 30 inches, the atmospheric pressure will hold a column of mercury up um, 29.92 inches. So let's read. It says, pressure is the force exerted by molecules as gravity and heat act upon them. All matter, solids, liquids, and vapors are attracted by the Earth's gravity and thus have weight. At sea level, for example, the Earth's gravity weighs approximately 14.7 pounds per square inch. This is the pressure at the, that the atmosphere exerts on the Earth's surface. And the point is this. We said that the air contains oxygen, nitrogen, and moisture, correct? So if we have all of this air above it, we have gravity down here, but how much air is up there? It's like 25 miles high before we get into outer space where there is no atmosphere. So if we have oxygen, nitrogen, and humidity, that has weight. We live in almost 15 pounds of pressure. That's exactly what we are surviving with on Earth at sea level. And that amount of pressure will actually hold a column of mercury up 29.92 inches, okay? So if it's below sea level, it's more pressure. If it's above sea level, it's less pressure. And that's what this is saying. So it says here, the weight of the Earth's atmosphere acting on a bowl of mercury will cause the mercury to rise 29.92 inches in a, in a mercury column. At elevations higher than at sea level, the concentration of molecules is not as great, and the atmosphere will not weigh as much. So the pressure decreases at higher elevations. Look at this, atmospheric pressure can be measured with an um, atmospheric barometer. You've heard that term before, barometer. That's what the weatherman uses on TV. He says, according to the barometer reading today, we got 30.13 inches. And so tomorrow it's going to rain. That's how they predict weather. Or today the barometer reading was 28.2.
so it's going to be hot and sunny tomorrow. And I don't know how they read it, but depending on the atmospheric pressure, they can predict the weather. And again, they're using a mercury instrument. So atmospheric pressure that we live in will hold a column of mercury up, which is below counter height, about 30 inches. Okay? So now, it says barometric pressure is measured in inches of mercury. So the point is, we can, we can hold a column of mercury up almost 30 inches, 29.92. As elevation is increased, barometric pressure decreases. I've got to spend some time with you on this so you understand what we're talking about. When we measure anything in this business, we say that we have, that we live in, we live in 14.7 um, pounds, but that's PSI a, absolute, that's absolute. We live in almost 15 pounds of pressure. But if I was to take a gauge right here and just lay it on the table, it's exposed to our pressure. We start everything at zero. So we live in zero pressure gauge because everything is more than what we live in or less than what we live in. So zero, then, we call that PSIG. And in refrigeration, whenever we ask you for pressures, it's gauge pressure. You do not do anything with absolute in this business unless you're an engineer and you are designing pressures inside of a system. But when we service or install or you read charts, it's gauge. Well, if that's true, then actually we could say that 14.7 or zero gauge will actually hold a column of mercury up 29.92 inches. So then we could say um, HGG -G mercury is equal to 29.92 inches. And all three of those mean the same. You got your 92 backwards. Uh, 29, oh yeah. I was testing you to see how long it would take you to see <laughs> that something, huh? Okay, 29.92 inches. Okay, so inches. So HG, mercury, it will hold it up, that quantity. But you see, if I reduce the pressure, then the mercury is going to drop. If I have less pressure, it could be 20 inches high. Now think about this, because I'm talking about terminology now. If I can remove the atmosphere, if I can reduce the pressure, we actually say that we are pulling a vacuum. Here. That's what this thing does. This is a vacuum pump. Turn it on and it sucks. Look, I put my finger on it and my finger's going in. And it's sucking my finger in. It's removing the atmosphere from right here and the pressure's holding my finger on there. You gotta understand that. Because you see, an air conditioner is nothing but tubes, a closed circuit. You have an outside coil, you have an inside coil, and you have a compressor. And so the entire system is closed. But if I braze everything together, it's got the same pressure that you and I live in, <coughs> zero gauge. But I can't go putting refrigerant gases in there with pressure that we live in. I have to remove all that pressure. So I want to pull a vacuum. And the terminology is I'm going to pull a vacuum in inches of mercury. That means I am pulling inches of mercury. How many, how many inches of mercury am I going to pull? Well, shoot, if I, if I really, if I pull a good vacuum, I can pull 29.92 inches. That means I'm going to pull a vacuum and the mercury drops 29.92 inches. That's what the terminology means. As good as that vacuum pump is, I cannot pull 29.92. I can pull 29.91 something, but I can never pull 29.92 because that's a perfect vacuum and that's a mechanical instrument or tool. And mechanical is not perfect. It's pretty darn close to perfect. And I'm going to show you how close to perfect it is. If I can pull a vacuum, I remove the atmosphere. If I can pull a vacuum, the mercury drops. <laughs> Have you ever taken a straw and taken a cup, put the 
straw into a cup of pop, pull it out, and you got no pop in the straw, right? Go in the cup, get some pop, put your finger on top. Now take it out, and there's pop in there, right? Atmospheric pressure is holding the pop up. That's exactly what's happening. How about if I suck on the pop? Put the straw in the pop, and I go, right? And I'm doing this so you remember this. If I suck on the pop, the pop goes up. I'm not sucking in anything. I am removing the atmospheric pressure from the straw. I'm a vacuum pump, right? I'm sucking nothing. The atmospheric pressure is pushing the pop up the straw. And that's a basic <coughs> from high school. It made no sense to us in high school what, we were, what, what they were talking about. But today, you better, you better understand that. So keep that in mind. If I suck on the pop, I'm pulling a vacuum. And that's the point. Can I really pull a good vacuum? Yeah, I can. You know how good? And I'm doing this so you remember. Have you ever taken a straw? Or have you ever taken a bottle? Remember the beer bottles or pop bottles? And you put your lips on there and you go, you know, and your lip goes in, bloop, like that, and your tongue goes in? I'm removing the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure is pushing my mouth and lips in. Really, it is. Okay, now watch. But how strong can we pull? If I take a straw, and if I put my finger on it, and I suck real hard, and my tongue would get stuck in there, right? And my finger would be stuck a little bit. But it's the pressure pushing it in. I am sucking nothing. All I'm doing is removing the pressure. I'm removing the atmospheric pressure, which is exactly what that pump does. Watch. A good vacuum pump can pull down to 29 point something. I really don't know exactly where, but it'll pull so much of the atmosphere out that it'll pull down to 29 point something. But how much is that something? The books tell you that when you put a vacuum pump on a system, you pull it down to 500 microns. What's a micron? Well, One a micron is a measurement. One inch equals 25,400 microns. And the books tell you to take a vacuum pump and pull, pull, pull the vacuum, pull the vacuum until you have 500 microns before a perfect vacuum. So the mercury goes down and down and down and down until it's 500 microns before 29.92 inches. And then they say you have a good vacuum on a system and it better hold. Well, what does that really mean? That simply says pull it down to 500 microns before this comes on down to almost nothing. And you have, that means you have actually, you can actually pull the mercury up too. But if I remove the atmosphere of the mercury, the mercury falls. Or if I've got mercury on a sealed container, I can pull a vacuum and I can actually pull it up into something. I'll pull it up the same way. But I am, the point is I'm pulling a vacuum in inches of mercury. <coughs> on a gauge, we measure in inches of mercury. We have to use a micron gauge to do it in microns. It's more accurate. We cannot see microns with our eyeballs. Because... How much is 500 microns? If 25,400 make up an inch, how much of an inch is 500? I don't know, but you can't see it very well with your eyeballs. I cannot watch the mercury drop, drop, drop until it's 500 microns. Because one micron equals the thickness of one Human hair. That's pretty small. So you take 500 of them and line them up, 
and that's about the equivalent of 500 microns. It's still pretty small. So when we tell you, when you pull down to 500 microns, that's really not good enough. You pull down to 300 microns, and it shut off your gauges and make sure it does not go above 500. You, that pump better pull down to 300 microns. But it doesn't. It pulls better. Vacuum pumps, vacuum pumps will pull down. That's why I went with Jeff today in the warehouse. I said, Jeff, I gotta confirm this. I says, you know, I know a lot about this business, but I says, and I know what these pumps do, but I wanna see it in writing before I tell them tonight. Vacuum pumps pull down, remember it's not perfect, they pull down to 25 microns. That's what they're <clears throat> capable of pulling down to. So 25 human hair thicknesses before a perfect vacuum. That's pretty significant. Which means that pump can pull down to 300 microns, no problem. Shut off your gauges and your micron gauge better not go up above 500, and your system is ready to do whatever you need to do with it. Charge it. That's what this business means, okay? You know what all of these are? Let's go back to the straw. How much of a vacuum can I pull with my mouth? Really, so you understand what is happening. And I do this just so you understand. This is an automotive vacuum gauge. It actually goes up to 25 inches of vacuum. Because in automotive, we got 20, 22, 23 inches maybe maximum. You don't need any more than that. Refrigeration gauge goes up to 30 inches. Um, I'm going to suck on the hose. This is, my, this is my gauge. You leave it alone after the class. So I can, this is my demonstrator, okay? I've used this a lot. I'm doing this so you can say, what did, he, what did he really talk about? Well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to remove the atmosphere. Remember the straw and your tongue gets stuck? If I remove the atmosphere, the same thing happens, but this needle will move. And that you're going to look at this, it's going to come up this way. On the outer edge here, you see where it says inches of vacuum? That's inches of mercury now. And you see where it says, and we're on zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 25. You tell them how many inches of vacuum I can suck on this thing. Ready? Just a second, I gotta get ready for this. This is, <laughs> here we go. How many inches? It's only so you remember. We have a little bit of fun with it, but all those things that we did as a kid with straws. You pulled about, I did 20 inches last night, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I did 18 inches today, that's usually what I do. But I'm removing the atmosphere, my tongue got stuck. Why do we really need to talk about this and make a little bit of humor with it? And so you, you understand, as we get to the next chart, what this is all about. Because if you don't understand this, and you put in an air conditioner or charge a customer maybe several thousand dollars, and maybe it just doesn't work, and maybe you're on your third compressor, or maybe you got about the 17th call in the summer, and you finally call me, and I'm going to say to you, did you pull it down to a 500 micron vacuum? And you'll say, oh, I know what that means now. Because that's what this business is about. Unless you understand what we're doing and why we do this. Somebody could be out there 20 years and say, oh yeah, I just put my vacuum pump on and I watch my gauge and needle moves and I'm done. Baloney. They know nothing. And that's why things don't work and last. And the more you know about this business to make things work and last, the more credible you become and then you command the price. Cheap doesn't work. Knowing what's happening is where it's at. Okay, let's go on. Questions at this point. Do you originally want to pull it down to 500 microns? Absolutely. Good oh. question. The books will tell you, and when we teach you the advanced class, we will show you in the book. Some books say pull it down to 500 and leave it there. Some other books will say pull it down to 300, and as long as it does not creep up over 500, you're done. You want a 500 micron to be retained in the system before you start to charge it. Yes, we're talking, because what are they telling you to... Otherwise, they tell you to pull down as close to a 29.92 inch vacuum. And a 29.92 inch vacuum with a gauge, you know nothing. Because a gauge is nothing but a, a, a mechanical needle. How accurate do you think my automotive gauge
age is. I got a hunk of plastic paper in here because I broke the glass 20 years ago in here. That's not even accurate, and that's why I use it for, for, for a demonstration. And it's the same thing with these here. That this is a good, inexpensive set of gauges. It's plastic, but you bang them around and they're not very accurate. A mercury manometer is accurate. So you're not and using I, that for the right to the man. Exactly, and this is what we use in the real world. But you're not talking about using those. Oh, those no. I'm, your five, five yes. Five as long as you understand what is out there, you can use this. But you better be real careful with it. And in the advanced class, we teach you how to be more careful with this, so you can be um, so you can become as close to accurate as possible. Do you need a micron gauge? Yes. Real world, you need it when you're in trouble. You need Abs it. No, Abs you need it yes. all the time. Of course. See, he lives in a desirable world. This is where you want to be. Is where is where he's talking about. If you use it all the time, what what you have found out, Scott, was that you can save time with it. You pull it down, the light goes on, or whatever you use on the analog one, it says 500 microns, 400 microns, you're done. With this here, you say, oh, gee, it looks pretty good. I'll go and do something. I'll put some tools away. You come back and say, gee, it still looks pretty good. It's close. It's not as accurate, but 90% of the technicians use this. And if that's all you got, you better use this real well. If you got a micron gauge, it's as close to the perfect world as you can be. Absolutely. He's got the... He's got the right attitude because it, it gives him credibility, saves him time, accurate. He knows exactly what has happened and nobody can question him or challenge him. You give a good example. Thank you. But the real world is this. What is the guy reading when he's reading on that? Is it 500 microns by the other micron page? There's no way at all that you can read microns on this. All you read no, is a microns, but what are you reading on there that supposedly there is equivalent to 500 microns? The micron gauge is more sensitive, that's all. No, no, no. Right inches of vacuum. Yeah. Oh, but like what every, are you reading in inches oh, of vacuum? The vacuum. air feeling is equivalent to 500 microns on that. 10 inches. Well, we don't know. In other words, if it goes from, watch this, and I think that that's a really good question because now it really proves what you're saying. What happens if you lost the vacuum from 500 to 900 uh, microns? You can see it real quick with a micron gauge. You can't see it at all on that. You may have to leave it there for a half a day to see something like that. And because maybe it'll move up now to uh, 2,000 microns, say, because it will continue to move. If you got a real teeny tiny leak, a micron gauge is for accuracy, and there's no callbacks. That's all I'm saying. But you see, the real world is not everybody has a micron gauge. Would I use a micron gauge today? Absolutely. Did I have a micron gauge 10 years ago? No, it wasn't available to me. Today, micron gauges are affordable. They were around, but I was not. I was. I never had one. However. Keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. I did have a mercury manometer, and a mercury manometer is a, is a step between that and a micron gauge. And I use my mercury manometer a lot, and I did it the same way. I used it on most calls. When the mercury came down to where it was supposed to be, I would shut off the gauges, and if the mercury didn't move, I was done. The micron gauge works quicker than the, than the mercury. That's the slowest, mercury is the next step up, and a micron gauge is the best. Does this not tell you when you lose your vacuum? Yes, it does tell you, but, but it's, it's slow, not, but not right, to slow to react. But this is the real world. And the point is, we're going to teach you the real world, and then it's up to you to see how accurate you want to be. It's not a perfect world, and I understand that. However, what about the technician who says, I don't even own one of these pumps? What are we doing? You know, what are we talking about there? You know, maybe he's got one gauge and he has no. How does he pull the vacuum? He doesn't. Now you're in a whole new set of troubles, and that comes in the advanced course. Okay. Questions? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let's go on. Um, now, Rob. If Rob was cooking an egg, and if it came to a boiling water, and he put the, he puts the egg in, how long do we say the egg would stay in? Five minutes. Five minutes. How warm is the water? 212 degrees. But what happens on the next page if Rob climbs Mount Whitney? Do you, do you ever go mountain climbing, Rob? No. Well, if Rob did go mountain climbing, um, he could be trying to boil an egg on the top of Mount Whitney. Look at this. The top of Mount Whitney is about... 2.2 miles high. We talked about the atmospheric pressure being less, correct? If it's less, that means the water boils sooner. 
Look at the boiling water temperature on the top of Mount Whitney when it's 2.2 2 miles high. It's only 182 degrees, not 212. Now how long, Rob, would it take you to make a soft boiled egg on the top of Mount Whitney? About two minutes. Huh? It's cooler! Oh, well, ten minutes. The water's boiling, it's changing state. And remember, the word boil only means change of state from liquid to vapor. It means nothing about temperature. Whatever the material is, if we lower the pressure, we lower the boiling point. We lower the vaporization temperature. If it took you five minutes at 212 degrees, Rob, how long would it take you to make a soft boiled egg on top of Mount Whitney? About seven minutes. I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, too. I don't know. We don't boil water at 182 here, so who knows, but it will take longer than five, correct? We'll go to Mount Whitney and find out. That's right. And, and the point, the point is this, that the higher the so. elevation, the lower the boiling point. So if you are really a mountain climber, and mountain climbers do carry pressure cookers. So when they cook in the mountains, the food does cook because it'll never cook unless you pressurize it and bring the boiling temperature up. Got that? You gotta understand Mount Whitney in order to understand pressures in a refrigerated <coughs> system, okay? Now, with that in mind, next page. Here we go. Are you ready in that? We're gonna go through a bunch of these now. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up to this. You gotta understand this chart. Do we all agree that the lower the pressure, the lower the boiling point of water? Okay? Here's the chart. Left side, degrees centigrade, forget about that. We will work with degrees Fahrenheit. This is temperature on the left side. This is the boiling point of water. Down here are pressures. Now watch. We are not going to use PSI absolute. And we are not going to use kilograms per centimeter. But we will use PSI G. This is gauge. And all we're saying here is that this is atmospheric, right here, zero, gauge. If we have zero, we have a boiling point of water. If we have higher pressure, we increase the boiling point. If we got lower pressure where we are pulling inches of vacuum, we have lower boiling point. Higher pressure, higher boiling point, lower pressure, lower boiling point. Are you getting ready in that? Yeah. Here is gauge pressure. This is the boiling temperature of water. And the boiling temperature of water at gauge is, according to this chart, anybody? 212. 212. Let's increase the pressure and see where the boiling point is. Annette? Uh, Rob's right. To me. <laughs> okay. Right. Increase the pressure. To uh, five pounds. Five, oh, look at this. Five pounds. Watch. Look at that. About 228. Yeah. So approximately 228 degrees. If we increase it to five pounds pressure, the water will not boil until 228 degrees. And under those conditions, how long would it take you to soft boil an egg, Rob? <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. I don't know. Huh? <laughs> Three minutes. But you but you bring the but you bring the pot to a boiling water. You throw the egg in there to put the pressure cap on now, see? Uh -huh. And we increase the temperature. And the point is, we got hotter water, don't we? Isn't it going to cook faster? Yep. Yes. See? And again, who knows? 30 seconds, a minute, I don't know. The point is this, ladies and gentlemen, here's your, here's your automobile, 15 pounds pressure. 15 pounds pressure, anywhere from 13 to 15 pounds pressure on a car. And your boiling point on a the car then could be, see? To about 250, 260 before it actually will boil and then your pressure cap, releases the pressure and so forth, okay? Let's lower the boiling point. In order for you to understand refrigeration, you must see what happens to water when we lower the boiling point. Let's pull inches of vacuum. Look at this. We can go all the way from zero all the way down. Let's go somewhere in between. Let's lower the boiling point and see where water boils. We want to pull how many inches of vacuum? And that. Uh, Rob left. Okay. 20. How many? Uh, vacuum of 20. I'm sorry? 20 I can't pounds hear. per square inch. Negative 20 pounds per square inch. 
Okay, so yeah, but how many inches of vacuum? 20. Oh, 20 inches of vacuum is what he said? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, you, okay, so you're going to go beyond 11, beyond 19, so be right what? About <laughs> here, you think? Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Sorry. 11 inches of vacuum, or 20 inches of vacuum, right? Right. Approximately 20 inches. Look at this. Holy Moses. What's approximately your boiling point? Between 150 and 160. Yeah. So you want to call it what? Maybe 155? So if we lower the pressure, the water would boil at 155 degrees. You better understand this, because when you're in trouble, I'll be asking you questions. If we lower the pressure, we have lowered the temperature. If we pull inches of mercury, we lower the temperature of water. So it boils from liquid to vapor. Lower. Annette. Next to him. Pull more inches of vacuum. Him? Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Pull more than 20. 30. Well, 29. you can't go 30. 30 is a perfect vacuum. 29. How many? 29. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you know what? He would actually get to probably about, about here. Look at what he did. It's your call. What do you think the boiling point is based on a lousy chart? Around 50. It might be 35, 40 degrees. You pull down to a 29-inch vacuum, and you're going to be oh, of a 29 point something. And what I'm trying to show you here, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you pull down a 29 point something, the boiling temperature of water will be below 32 degrees. <laughs> but the point is, when it, when it boils, it freezes. And we show that in a lab. If you got little droplets, you pull a vacuum, and you watch the little droplets go boom, and they flash into ice and fall down. Because it flashed into vapor, and it froze because it's like 30, 29 degrees, and it turns to ice. The lower the pressure, it goes from liquid to vapor. If we can lower the, the if we can lower the boiling point, if we can lower the pressure, we can lower the boiling point. This is a crude demonstration. I've used this probably for a half a dozen years. Water. Would you come up here and feel this? And I want you to tell them exactly what you feel, because we're going to show you something now. What do you feel right now? Uh, warm, right, it's a little bit lukewarm because I have it sitting right next to the exhaust on this overhead. I did that on purpose because it gives a better demonstration. If I demonstrate this to you at 70 degrees, it works, but it's not too good. It works better. It is probably, I don't know, 80 maybe. Ooh, it was warm though, right? Nothing but water. Let's see if we can do it. It is changing state from liquid to vapor. Wow, that must be hot. Come on up here and feel it. Anybody, come on. I want to have a dozen of you up here. You come up here and feel it, and then you sit down. You tell him again. He felt it when we started, and it's cooling off. The point is we're going from liquid to vapor. And if we continue this for hours, guess what happens to the water? It'll vaporize and we'll have a chunk of ice in there. Anybody else? Come on, I want you to come on up and feel it. I had everybody come up last night and feel this thing. Who else wants to come on up and feel it? Come on. Nobody else? Come on. You come on up and feel it again. Everybody feel this because we are only used to burning our hands. It's not cold, but it's, it's, it's getting there. And of course, every time you put your hands on there, you're adding BTUs to the water. <coughs> are you burning your hand, though? It's just sitting there breaking up. It's going into vapor.
But it started out warm to the touch. Anybody else? Are you ready for this? Listen up now. Right now, you come in. It's cool. He started out with a warm bottle. And it got, it's cool. I don't know what it is. It might be 65, 68, but it was, it was like 80-ish. If we lower the pressure, we lower the boiling temperature. How long will it take you, Rob, to boil an egg if, the, if we are boiling water at 29 degrees, how long will it take you to boil an egg now? Forever a couple of weeks. <laughs> what do you mean forever a couple of weeks? I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen, it'll yeah. rot. Right. <laughs> don't eggs rot in your refrigerator if you don't take them out? Why are we doing this? It's because of this. If I have lots and lots of feet, and I don't know how many feet of tubing are in the system. I don't know. I don't know, 50, 100, 200, I don't know, it makes no difference. If it's a sealed system, what happens if somewhere in that system, compressor is outside, coil is outside, and that's inside, and I got a 130 foot line set. Here, that coil is there, and the condenser is on the other side of the building, 130 feet away. It's still a sealed system. But just for the heck of it, Somewhere, I have, and you can't see that, no, no, Bleak. Uh, I have a, a 50th of a drop of water sitting right there. Oh, it's moisture. See, the atmosphere has got humidity, oxygen, nitrogen. But just what happens if there is a microscopic drop of water actually sitting there? And I, and I pull it, and I, and I put it in my vacuum pump, and, I, and the vacuum pump goes, let's suck all the atmosphere out. Well, big deal. Do you, do, you, do you think the drop of water is just going to roll down the tube over to the vacuum pump? No. It goes nowhere unless I can boil it and change the state from liquid to vapor. Now the pump will pull the vapor right out. That's why we pull a vacuum. That's why we pull a vacuum not only to remove air and nitrogen and humidity, but it's for that microscopic drop of water that's somewhere maybe in the bottom of the compressor under the oil because the, because the specific gravity of water is heavier than oil, because the specific gravity of oil is lighter than water. So the microscopic drop of water is in the bottom of the sump of the compressor. And so if I can, if I can pull a vacuum down to 500 microns, which is almost a perfect vacuum, and we know that if we go down to 29 point something, we can boil water when it freezes. Boy, it's 70 degrees outside. I got a real good chance of boiling water if I can pull down to a 500 micron vacuum. But if I have a wet system full of humidity and maybe there's three drops of water in that compressor, maybe I got it out with the gauge, maybe. I got a pretty good chance, but I got an excellent chance with a micron gauge, no guessing involved. Does it make sense now what we're talking about, vacuum pumps and, and, and mercury and inches of mercury and microns? Now we know why we have to do these things, okay? I met a good customer on a call last summer. You've got to know this. The technician has been in this business longer than me. I won't tell you who the customer is, of course. Technician is a good, a good, good technician. His vacuum pump. He pulls it out. I said, let's, let's pull the vacuum. I said, you got your micron gauge? Oh, yeah, I got one of those. Well, I believe in those. Nothing. It couldn't even peg the 25,000 light. That's where the vacuum gauge or the micron gauges start at 25,000 microns. Couldn't even start there. I says, let's put the gauge on there and see what's happening. I couldn't even pull. We couldn't even pull 20 inches. Got a lousy vacuum pump. 
He couldn't even pull 20 inches. Well, yeah, no, no, it wasn't a hole. It was a good system, it's pump. The pump couldn't pull it out itself. 20 inches, because I put the gauge right on the pump. But you see, at 20 inches, whoever gave us 20 inches, look at where the boiling point of water was. So, was he getting any moisture out? I don't know. Is he going to boil water when the boiling point at 20 inches is about 155 degrees? And it's 70 degrees outside? He's not boiling anything. Does that make sense? Your vacuum pump better be in good condition and that's why you change oil. So you can pull down to that 25 microns. This is good stuff. If you follow the rules, this business works. Diagnosing is a piece of cake. It's easy. But if you don't understand the basics, you're a purchase changer then. So I hope we've impressed upon you this part of it. Now to understand this, now we bring you into a pressure temperature chart. Before we get into that questions, this is heavy stuff right now. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you. That's why I write myself notes. Why do you think they pressurize airplanes? <laughs> do you think they pressurize airplanes so you can boil eggs? <laughs> you know, you've got a plane five miles high. Mount Whitney was 2.2. You can't breathe very well. That's why they pressure airplanes so we can breathe because our body is used to 15 pounds pressure. I had a student from last night ask me this morning. He says, how do they pressurize airplanes? I said, I don't know. Call the airport. I don't know. <laughs> but what about the spaceman? Now watch. Watch. The spaceman in outer space. <clears throat> Guess how many inches of mercury is in outer space? 29.92. Perfect vacuum. No atmosphere. Huh? Well, but that's why we pressurize suits in outer space. That's why when, when, when the spaceman is walking outside, he's got a pressurized suit. How about in the movies when he goes outside and he snags the suit and it rips? What happens to him? He goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's happening to him? What, you're going to love it? His blood is changing state. Boiling his blood from liquid to vapor. He has no pressure release. Isn't that weird stuff? All of a sudden, he's in a vacuum. He was pressurizing all of a sudden into a perfect vacuum. But it makes sense, right? If we can control the pressure, ladies and gentlemen, we can control the boiling temperature of refrigerants, too. Now I teach you how to read a pressure temperature chart. Here we go. On the chart, we have degrees in Fahrenheit in both columns. And if you look down, these are temperatures, but we are only going to be working with one refrigerant, and that is R22. And these are the pressures. The point is, put the temperature in here right now, about 70. Let's go find 70 degrees. Here it is, right here. If it's 70 degrees, then I know a tank of R22 would be approximately 121 pounds pressure. That's all. And if I actually put a pressure gauge on a tank of R22, and if it read 121 pounds pressure, then I know it would be about 70 degrees. What does that mean? That means it's in a state that if I add BTUs to it, I get more vapor and more pressure. If I remove BTUs, I get less vapor and less pressure. That's all it means. So if I get a tank, I can either heat it or cool it. If I take R22 and throw it out on the floor, what pressure is it in? Gauge. Zero. Zero, right? Let's go find zero pressure. Let's see. Lower pressure will be here. Come over here. Lower pressure, lower pressure. Oh, look at that. Right here. Atmospheric pressure right there. Because all these asterisks are vacuums. So if I have atmospheric pressure, if I take R22 and throw it in the middle of the floor, what's the temperature, the boiling temperature of R22 at that point? 24. Ah! 24. Right. 
It's atmospheric pressure. And again, I'm teaching you how to read this though. I come over here to the I come over here to the temperature, R22 at atmospheric. It'd be down. And it causes severe frost. Yes. Minus 40, ladies and gentlemen. Minus 40 atmospheric pressure. If I was in the Antarctic, and I watched a movie the other night on TV where he got some goofballs out there and it's minus 100 degrees. But if these goofballs, and I don't know why they would run around at minus 100, but if they were in a temperature at minus 40, they could actually take a bucket and pour R22 in there and it would be just like water because it's already at that temperature. And they could just walk around with it and throw it on the floor and it just sits there and it rolls around like water. But it's 70 degrees here. What's the temperature of that floor? A little cooler because it's on the ground, but let's say it's 70 degrees. If I throw 20, R22 on there, that becomes minus 40. It absorbs the BTUs at a tremendous rate, and it vaporizes the liquid into a gas, and it goes away and takes the BTUs with it. It's boiling at a low temperature, and at zero degrees, minus 40. You got a five minute tape to watch. I made this several years ago. It explains to you what happens. Listen to the details, please. Are we all set with this thing here? I think so. Five minutes only. Listen to the details. We're going to get there. to show what happens to refrigerant 22 when it's poured right into the atmosphere. We know that R22 boils at approximately minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit at zero pounds per square inch gauge. So that's atmospheric pressure. We're going to fill up the cup with some liquid 22. We'll get the cup down to temperature so it will hold it in liquid form. Then we're going to pour it on some of these items here and see what happens. So, let's put them in here. We're doing this outside in the summertime. It's about 75 degrees. You want to zero in on that thing? Yeah. I'm going to get off the side so we don't get in that. And we're doing this on June 28, 1992, just before the legislation wasn't yeah. 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 You see that in your mind? Yep. Dip it right in there. 40 degrees below, let's force it around there. I'm going to be careful because that's cold. There it is. 40 below zero. Banana. I still got some liquid refrigerant here, let's pour it back. Let's try the water over here. I'm not sure what will happen here, but that will turn to ice pretty quick. Ready? Give me cubes we can make.
we can control the boiling point and the temperature. Okay. Soft grapes. Soft. Here we go. Can you get that? It's cold on the fingers. That's pretty hard. There was like a stone. Yeah. One more thing here, I think we'll leave. And then we'll be done. I think the banana peeling turned out pretty good, right? Just a couple more days, you can't do this at all. So now it's unfilled for the students. system. Oh, well, by the way, on this here we have our um, seven locations for park supply. Should have mentioned that at the beginning, but that's okay. All right, in any event, here we go. This here, of course, we call the compressor. Now, that means every refrigeration system has a compressor, because all refrigeration systems, again, do the same thing. We move we move refrigerant that has vaporized after it has absorbed heat. And so we push that refrigerant into the outdoor coil, which would be a central air conditioner or any coil in the ambient, and then we call that a condenser. So we call that coil a condenser. Now, when we push this refrigerant into the condenser, this particular line is called the discharge line. And again, we do this now so you understand the terminology. So we discharge vapor refrigerant into the condenser, and we, we condense. We, the the, the heat-laden vapor gives up the BTUs, and it condenses into a liquid. And then, of course, we come down into a liquid line, and that's exactly what this is called, the liquid line. L-I-Q-U-I-D, right? Liquid line. We continue all the way over. We'll get rid of that drop of moisture. And this here is called a dryer, D-R-I-E-R, -E and a filter. A dryer and a filter, if there should be any amount of moisture left in a system, just because these systems are not perfect, and in fact, even refrigerant, virgin refrigerant, brand new refrigerant, has actually a certain very teeny tiny amount of moisture in it. So we don't want moisture floating throughout the system, and so the dryer will absorb the normal amount that would be in the system. So that's why we also call it a, a dryer and a filter, so we get no sediment through it. And then we end up with a metering device. In a metering device, there's actually three of them. One would be a capillary tube, we'll call that a cap tube. 
two, we call that an, an orifice. <laughs> and the third type would be um, an expansion valve. The point is that we go from the liquid line and we have to go through some kind of a metering device, and this here would be a picture of a capillary tube. But a capillary tube and an orifice are fixed restrictors. There's no movable parts, but an expansion valve, valve is automatic. So actually then this here is what we call the high side. This is our high pressure side. Ah. If that's the high side, after we go through the metering device, we then jump from there into the low side. And so on the low side, we would now call that, let's do this in a different color, we would call this an evaporator. <laughs> because that's where evaporation. evaporation takes place, right. On the other side over here, we, we condense from vapor into a liquid, so we call that a condenser. Over here, we evaporate from a liquid into a vapor, so we call that a vapor, and that is the low side. And then, of course, we finish up by going back into the compressor, and this is our suction line. Spread that out a little bit so you can read that. That is a suction line. Okay? Now, here's the way the system works. We take heat-laden vapor in vapor form, and we go through the line. And we go into our condenser in vapor form. Vapor, vapor, vapor. And we're pushing, pushing, pushing compressing. As we are compressing, we are increasing its heat. Are you ready in that? I want a nice hot summer day. Somebody. Uh, in the corner. Hot summer day. 100 degrees. 100 degrees. <laughs> it's 100 degrees. That's our ambient. So we actually have a fan that is blowing 100 degree air through that coil. And remember, heat moves from hot to cold. So in order for the refrigerant in vapor form to give up the BTUs to the very cool 100 degrees, we better make that condenser hotter than 100, and typically it's about 30 degrees hotter. So we would say then that it would be about 130 degrees. That doesn't, yeah, that don't look too good there. So let's say 130 degrees, is that better? So it's about 130 degrees. That is hotter than 100. So 100 is very cool to 130. How do I know it's 130 degrees, though? How do I know that? I can take my pressure gauge, and I can put it on the fitting on the high side. And if my fitting, if my gauge said that my pressure was 297, then I would know it was 130 degrees. And that's how we use a pressure temperature chart. So we know what our condenser temperature is. So the gauge tells us exactly how hot it is. This is all part of the advanced class when, when we get into how to use these, but that's how we know that it's 130 degrees. So ladies and gentlemen, if I put my gauge on there and it says that it was how much again? 297 PSI, correct? It's almost 300 pounds pressure. It is 130 degrees. It's 130 degrees right there and nowhere else. Right where it condenses. So it's 130 degrees right where it goes from vapor into liquid. It is not 130 degrees above it, and it is not 130 degrees below it. Because above it, it's hotter. Your discharge on a 100 degree day, I'm telling you, you touch it, it'll take your skin off. <clears throat> Remember soft boiled eggs, boiling water? You're probably above that. I don't know. You might be 220 PSI or 220 degrees, maybe you're 240. I don't know. All I do know is it takes the skin off if you touch it on a 100 degree day. But the point is, that's still hotter than 100 degrees. 
This is hotter than 100 degrees. And down here at the bottom, you will have approximately 120 degrees. So it'll be about 10 degrees difference, maybe 12, maybe 13 degrees difference. But at the bottom, it'll be cooler than the condensing temperature. But isn't 120 degrees still hotter than 100 degrees? Isn't the fan still blowing the cool 100 degree air through the liquid? And so the liquid is giving up BTUs? Vapor, liquid, this is liquid all the way back. This is your high side. Watch now, you have to understand this, please. Stay with me on this. This is liquid. This is liquid. Here we go. Liquid, liquid, all the way over, liquid, through the filter, liquid, through the metering device, whatever it is, through the, into the low side, and then we get into the evaporator. On a 100 degree day, Watch now. Scott, on a 100 degree day with your air conditioner, if everything is working the way it should, and you're, you might be there, you might not be there either, what temperature do you like inside your house? 100 degree day. 100 degree day, and your air conditioner is working, and you want a cool house. What temperature is your house? 82. 82? 75. You might be right. Air conditioner is shut off. Right, the air conditioner isn't going to shut up, but it is removing BTUs. And again, the more of this we do, the better we get. You're probably about average, because when it's a little cooler, it might be 78, that's about average. Does anybody else have it any cooler, if you have an air conditioner at home? If it's a 100 degree day, what, what do you have inside your house? Anybody got it any cooler than that? Yeah. What? Tell them again. <laughs> you listen to what she just said. I hear. It's a hundred degree day, and what's your first name? What's your first name? Jan. Jan? Jan's house on a hundred degree day, and Jan's house will be. You tell. Them. You bet you. Yes. So you are a refrigeration person, and whatever you're doing, if your house is. I should be able to set it to whatever I want. Yes. And it better be big enough to cool it down at 100 degrees. Because the point is this, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in this business, you are a refrigeration person. And you make sure that the air conditioner is size right. And you make sure that if it's 115 out there, your house is 70 degrees. Because I'm going to tell you, when it's 110 outside, you come and visit me, you're wearing a sweater in my house. And you're going to wear a sweater in Jan's house. You come to our house. And it is going to be cool. Yes, it's costing us a little more in electricity. <laughs> so, all I, it's, you're right. The average, most people will, on a 100 degree day, that's all I was asking him before. Scott is absolutely correct. On a 100 degree day, hot relative humidity, you will be very comfortable at 80, 82 degrees inside your house. And all I'm saying to you is it depends on what you want out of life. And when it's 110 degrees outside, I want 70 in my house, and I'm getting it. No matter what. I, I live in a cool house, and I drive a cool car. And that's just the way it is, because I'm a refrigeration person. Why not? That's our business, right? Does it cost me more than electricity? Yeah! But that's why I give up something else. Okay? I come here and teach you, and then Jeff feeds me. So I don't have to pay for our people, right? <laughs> so I use that for my electric bill. All I'm saying is that that's the average, but it's okay to be cool. But watch now. I'm leading you someplace. Watch what happens here. Pay attention. Because you see, if we do have a 70 degree house, and it's 100 degrees outside, your evaporator is going to look like this. Ooh, my pen is leaking. 100 you will have a 100% full evaporator, full of liquid, that is boiling from liquid to vapor under those conditions. And then if it's a perfect system under those conditions, then what you have left is vapor coming back through the suction line, coming back to the compressor, and there's vapor inside the compressor. And all we're trying to say that is if you got 70 degrees, you better be charged properly. And if you got 80 degrees under those conditions, you better be charged properly. And that's part of the advanced class. Because you see, we charge 
by what the customer really keeps the temperature in the house. Otherwise, you're overcharged or you're undercharged. So all I'm saying to you is that whatever the conditions are, and if you like 70 degrees, if it's 85 out, or 95 or 105, your air conditioner is charged just a little bit differently. Is that the real world? Do we ask the customer, do you like 80 or do you like 70? We don't ask them that, though. That's not the real world. You come back to the advanced class, we teach you how to deal in the real world. The problem is going to be that instead of somebody's compressor lasting 20 years, and if you're not charged perfectly, it might last 19 and a half years. That's acceptable, though, isn't it? Who would know? But maybe you're just a little bit more off than just a little bit. Now maybe the compressor goes out three times in a summer. And that's what we teach you about in the advanced class, how to prevent that, how to diagnose. If you come back to the advanced class, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that you will learn how to diagnose compressors. And there's nobody better around to teach you that than me. I'm the one that's got the experience, and I talk from experience. I teach you shortcuts and teach you how to diagnose. Oh, Mr. Jones, are you on your third compressor? How come? Let's, let's talk about it. What caused it? Oh, the other two were just replaced and nobody looked to see what caused it? Let me ask you some questions. So when I replace a third one, maybe you won't have to go to a fourth one. That's what it's about. Let me continue, though. What's the temperature of this coil under these conditions? If I have, if we got a 70 degree house, let's just say maybe, maybe the return air is 75 degrees going through the coil. And on the other side of the coil in the supply, it would be maybe about 60 degrees. <coughs> So in order to reduce the temperature from 75 to 60 and get rid of some of that latent heat, what do you think the temperature of that coil is? It's about 40 degrees. Sure. Well, it's approximately. You know, and, and that will alter depending on the conditions. If we just turn if we if we just turn on the air conditioner in a hot house, the temperature is going to be hotter. There's a lot of stuff on there right now. Well, yes, exactly. But wait a minute. How do I know that's 40 degrees? The gauge. Right. I stick my low side gauge on there, and what I end up finding is 68 pounds pressure, and that equals 40 degrees above zero. Okay? Are you okay with that? Okay. On temperature? Okay. But what I'm saying is, if I can control it at 68 pounds pressure, watch. I want 40 degrees. Is it okay if I go colder though? Jan likes 70. She'll probably have a 38 degree coil. Scott is the average. He might have a 45 degree coil because he's got warmer air coming back. His pressure would be higher. Jan's pressure would be lower. But the point is, if I can control that pressure, I can control that temperature and I can do anything I want with it. I want this here to be 30 degrees hotter than the ambient. I'll control the pressure. This controls the pressure. I want this to be 40 degrees above zero. I'll control it with this. And the engineers do that. Okay? One more thing and then I'll let you ask a question. Watch. If this is 40 degrees, watch this now. If that's 40 degrees, and if I put a thermometer on my suction line, and I measure 50 degrees, how many degrees warmer is my suction line than my evaporator? The evaporator is 40, and my suction line is 50. How many degrees warmer is it? Yeah. Isn't my vapor warmer than what it was when it first became a vapor over here? It's called superheat. We've got 10 degrees of superheat right now. And we teach you how to charge a system by superheat. You gotta know how to take it. You gotta use gauges. You have to use thermometers. Here, look at this. We said that we knew that this was 130 degrees when it condensed, correct? How do I know this down here is 120 down here? If it's 130 condensing, how do I know it's 120 here? Put a thermometer on it. See? The gauge tells us the change of state temperature. So it showed us condensing temperature. Over here it shows us evaporating temperature. 
this is heavy right here. This is this is hard stuff. It, when when you're just getting into it. Questions. You gotta have questions on this. We always get three questions on this. <laughs> well, basically, yes. I just want to. Um, when you were going through the high side, yes. If I tend to get your meter device, I noticed that you, you didn't mention that it that it, um, that it flashed off or pulled off at that point as it exited. Yes. Your device. Yes. But I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Yes. In other words, right. This is the separate. That's a really good question because I'm giving you the ideal conditions. Only if Jan's house is 70 degrees. If Jan's house is 70 degrees, the whole entire coil is like this. If her house was down to 85 because she turned it on when it was 100, you might have that. That's not very good, but you might end up having that. What is that? In other words, it's partially full because it's still trying to cool down. And the return air might be 85 degrees instead of 75. So it's partially full of liquid. At that point. But when we, re when we reach the ideal condition for everything to be perfect, if we had a 70 degree house, that's completely full. But this is the separation between the high side and the low side, right there. We call it an, ex uh, it's, uh, it's all scribbled up here now, but we call it a metering device. It's an expansion device. We go from high pressure liquid into low pressure and we expand. Doesn't liquid expand into a vapor and take up more room? That's why suction lines are big and liquid lines are small. It takes up more room. Does that help? There's a lot on here and we can do a lot with this. You know, we can erase it and go through a lot of it and we do that in the advanced class and we show you what the consequences are. We will bring in a live unit and show you what happens with a um, overcharge and an undercharge. We'll show you what happens to superheat and subcooling. Okay? For this class, ladies and gentlemen, I can't go too deep into this because it's only a basic class. This is nothing but a pump. You need to just know the terminology. Okay? Are we okay with that at this point? Yes, question. Uh, on a sight glass. Yes. Well, you see the you see like the uh, bubbles going through it? Is that boiling at that point? Well, keep in mind. Now, in the products that we saw, we don't uh, use sight glasses for charging. Different manufacturers do it differently. But a sight glass will typically be at the end. But that's a good question. Don't we have all liquid here? And when you got bubbles, you don't have all liquid. You're vaporizing. You're undercharged then. So there's boiling, don't Yes, but again, there are different methods, and we will teach you a method of charging without a sight glass, though. We don't use a sight glass. Okay? Question? We okay? How would liquid get yeah. into the compressor? How would liquid get Oh! Jan's house! Jan's house! Jan says, oh, 70 degrees, it's not cold enough. Would you make it colder? Sure. <laughs> all we need to do is this. If we end up having no vapor and all liquid, correct? And that's what we do in um, advanced class. All liquid, and then we end up getting liquid in here, and boom, we lose the compressor. There's all kinds of reasons. <coughs> um, you got company come over, and they close the registers, because in Jan's house, you got to wear a sweater like you do in mine. And they say, gee, it's cold. I'll close that register. See, I'll close this one and this one, and I won't tell Jan's. Now the return air is cooler. Now we've, all, now we've taken away some of that return air. We don't have enough of the heat load, not enough heat to boil off the refrigerant, and we get liquid back to the compressor. So that's one way. But when Jan says, Jan says, you know, I just would like it a little bit better than what it is. So a lot of technicians who don't know say, I'll make it better. We'll add gas. That's the last thing you do. We don't add gas. And that's, that's the advanced class. I don't want to teach you that here. The last thing we do is add gas. You never have to add anything. Never, never, never. Never add gas. But we always add gas. Yeah. We got service calls and they say, please add some freeze on. Top it off. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's in the advanced class, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this was only for terminology and I want to finish up on that note there. Okay, now I got more things here for you. Would you go over to the next page, please? Just so you know. We're about 15 minutes behind. Um, so we get out of here in about another 25 minutes. These are pictures of evaporators. These are refrigerator evaporators. 
<laughs> but they're simple. They're, they're nothing but evaporators, the same kind of an evaporator that's over there. This is an air-cooled evaporator and a side-by-side -side refrigerator, and this is a manual defrost. In the automatic defrost and the side-by-side, -side, it defrosts twice a day. This is a manual defrost. How often do we defrost a manual defrost refrigerator? In, in, in the freezer section. How often? Whenever we do it. One student said, when I can't fit any more food in there. <laughs> and this goes back to your question. Maximum ice on a residential refrigerator, manual defrost, is one quarter inch, not six inches. One quarter inch is because ice is an insulator. If we insulate the evaporator, we cannot get the heat load from the food to the evaporator, and of course we liquid slug a compressor. If we ice up a coil on a system, we cannot get the air to the coil. If we don't have enough air, we don't get enough beat to use to the coil. Those are all reasons for liquid slugging a compressor, okay? Again, I'm just touching on this here. The next page. These are pictures of condensers. <laughs> on condensers, it's the same thing as your central air conditioner. This is a picture of a refrigerator that has an air-cooled condenser. We have a fan that blows air through it. On your central air conditioner, we got the same thing. We got a fan that blows very cool air through it. The air conditioner works great <laughs> if I blow 100 degree air through it. This, re this condenser in your kitchen works great if I can blow 100 degree air through it on a hot summer day without air conditioning in the kitchen. It's 100 degrees in the kitchen, so what? It works fine. However, it better be clean. I challenge you, go home tonight, pull the grill off your refrigerator if you got something like that. And if you can't see the coil because there's too much dog here and fuzz, clean it. Because on a hot summer day, if you got leaves and cotton wood in your central air, you're going to burn up a compressor. And you will liquid slug it. So that's the other answer to your question, Dan. When we, when we have a plugged condenser, we overheat, and we build up so much pressure that we push all the liquid through the suction line right back into the compressor. This again comes down to diagnosing, okay? So it's the same thing here. We lose compressors and refrigerators by the same way. Condensers have to be clean. Central air conditioner has to have clean condensers. If you, uh, on your refrigerator at home, you may have a static condenser that's on the back wall. This is a picture of one that's actually inside the wall and you can't see it, but it's stapled on the inside. <laughs> we said over here that the condenser on the top is hot. Watch now. It's hot over here, cooler in the middle, and coolest at the bottom. So is your refrigerator condenser. Go home tonight. Take the soft part of your arm. If you got a static condenser, feel it. Ah, hot up here while it's running, cooler over here, come all the way down and touch it. You don't use your hands because they're calloused. You can't feel so much. Hot, a little cooler, the coolest at the bottom. If you got an air-cooled one, vacuum it off, stick your hand in there. While it's running, touch the top, nice and warm. Touch the middle, cooler, at the bottom it's coolest. If it's a 100 degree day, if it's a 100 degree day, remember, it'll take the skin off on a central air. If it's a 100 degree day, you touch that coil in your refrigerator, you're going to burn your fingers. And that's good. It's working. That's the way it's made. So condensers are very hot on hot days, and they work just fine. They're hot to you and me, but not to a coil and not to a compressor. Okay, the last page on there, then I got a video tape to show you. The last page is just um, airflow, and it shows you that you also have supplies and, re and returns in your refrigerator. So you got supplies and returns in your, in your house, you got supplies and returns in your refrigerator. All we're simply doing is taking some refrigerator air and going through a coil and blowing very cold, cold air back into the refrigerator compartment a very small portion of very cold air. But it's all the basics, it's all the same. We don't want to get, we don't want to get a coil that's very dirty. After about 20 years, your refrigerator, the fan gets all full of dirt. So does, so does, your, so does your central air in the, furn in the, in the blower in, in the furnace get full of dirt. And then the coil gets full of dirt in a central air conditioner too, if you don't change filters. Or maybe you take the filter out and, the, and then the coil acts as a filter. The same thing in your refrigerator. You get a dirty coil, you don't circulate enough air. 
Okay? That's all I'm going to leave you with on the basics of that, but now I've got a videotape to show you for safety. This is the goosebump one, okay? Uh, after I get through the videotape, I will ask for a couple of you to um, tell us what was good for you to learn tonight. So during the videotape, I want you to watch, listen to the details on the tape. You have to tell us what was good for you to learn here tonight. That's important, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you something. Oxygen tank. As technicians, we use those for oxyacetylene rigs. In this business, we do not use oxygen to blow out refrigeration systems. This videotape is from the 50s. It's the only one that I got, and I've shown it several hundred times. Every time I watch it, I learn something new. It tells you about a refrigerator technician who blew out a refrigeration system with oxygen, and he blew the house up. It says $15,000 damage. Today, it's like over $100,000 damage. He talks, he's, he's a southern man, you cannot understand him very well. It's a poor taste. Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen up now. He says very clearly that when he let the oxygen go through, he says he heard the air come out. And it's not air, it's oxygen coming out through the capillary tube. He said he sat back, he lit up a cigarette, but that didn't cause the explosion because the oxygen was inside the system. He's just telling you what he did. And he says he went to cut the dryer off. He said that's when he heard the air. And he says that's, and the way, the way he talks in the southern uh, way of talking, instead of saying it blew up, he doesn't say that. He says it blowed, B-L-O-W-D. But when you hear that, you'll understand what he's saying. Uh, it's only like uh, 12 minutes. Um, we will discuss this after the tape. You listen to the details. It gives me goosebumps. That's <laughs> great. Then I'll tell you a story about it. Scott. Scott. Do. Yeah, Mount Do. It's a bridge. It's a bridge. Listen very clearly to the details, please.
inside the house was a mess of wreckage. The den was covered with plaster, splinters of wood, broken glass. The furniture was ripped and torn. Joists were ripped apart like toothpicks. Electrical wiring was hanging from the straps. Copper water pipes burnt out of shape. Scraps of metal were lying about. The refrigerator door was protruding through one wall. The remains of the compressor sat by the lonesome looking under the wreckage. The state fire marshal began his investigation, putting pieces together from the hoses and copper wiring that were left. Tanks, gauges, and tools were everywhere. But by this, the investigation continued. This vacuum pump went through this wall and down these steps and stopped on the dim landing. Seconds before, the homeowner had come down these stone steps and had gone through the wall of the right when the explosion occurred. Oxygen was it? 
take to cause an explosion? How much oil? Does it have to be under pressure? Do traces of acid from the previously burned out compressor have any effect? How long does it take for a reaction to take place? We know there are always traces of oil in every part of a refrigeration system. Why then did this explosion apparently take place in the compressor? trade schools and they told me that they had samples of oxygen tanks that blew up and uh, one guy lost an arm and another guy got killed and so forth so I hear these stories well through the years what I have learned is this that the oxygen plus the refrigerant and the oils and so forth cause this so that's a basic in this business you never take oxygen and flow it through any refrigeration system refrigerator or air conditioner otherwise you're dead I mean, that's it. You don't, you don't get a second chance. I'm very concerned about this right now because the same rules apply when you buy an oxygen regulator. The instructions that you get when an oxygen regulator tell you do not oil the regulator to go put it on your tank. And I used to do that. I used to put a drop of oil or two on there and I put it on because it would go on nice and easy. And the rules are one lousy drop of oil on your regulator, and if the conditions are right, ba-boom, the same violent explosion. And I can't even imagine that. They tell you to only clean the treads with a brush or something. Yes? I have a question. With oxygen or heat the No. And that's the point. Because the other story that I heard about was garage mechanic in a small town coveralls, working on a car, grease, his air compressor didn't work, he hooked up his hose to an oxygen tank, blew himself off, and he became an instant inferno. All I know is grease and oxygen, all I know is the conditions have to be correct, and I don't know what the correct conditions are. I don't know that. But all I do know is that this stuff is more dangerous than what we know about. So all I'm saying is, and I'm passing this on to you, and I'm not done with you yet, a drop of oil can cause the same thing. The other night, when I taught this class in Homewood, after the class, a student came up, a technician came up, and he says that he was also a fireman. And he says, I have to go find something out. And I'm telling you what he told me. He says, I am 100% positive that when we get a wrecked car and there's fuel and all that all over the ground, he says, if that car is laying on somebody, we have to jack it up and we use these, these cushions. He says, we use oxygen tanks to blow them up. He says, I've got to find out. And I says, no, you don't. I says, you're using nitrogen. He says, I'm almost positive it's oxygen. Compressed. I made him so suspicious that he's going to ask, and I insisted that he call me back to let me know. Based on what I know today, as of today, he may be right. Because I'm going to tell you this. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past, we used to use refrigerant to clean out systems. It was very cheap, and I've done my share of cleaning out, and it's a very simple process. You can, you can use F11, you can use R22, R, R and you blow out a system, and, you, and it's like brand new when you're done. And we can't do that anymore. So what do we use today to blow out a system? Nitrogen. And that's what you're supposed to do also when, when, when you braze and so forth, correct? What color is the oxygen tank? Green, green. What color is the nitrogen tank? Darker green. What color did they say the oxygen was in the video 20, 30 years ago? Orange, you said. I don't know what the real color is. I have been to some trade shows, and I saw the questions come up by, by, uh, by suppliers of these tanks, and they were challenging them. And I, Now, all I know is what I remember from that trade show, that the colors aren't consistent. Okay, that's fine. But I know better, don't I? Look, oxygen, male thread. Nitrogen, female. Oh, yeah? 
because after last night's class, one of the people that was in the class challenged me this morning. He says, because I told them last night, I said, do you know that you can actually, um, and it's always been taught in classes, and I picked this up from other lectures. They say that you can use an oxygen regulator when you're in a pinch on a nitrogen tank, and vice versa. So I said, that, gee, that sounds good. So he says, yeah, but you can't. He says, look at that. The fittings are different. I says, okay, I'll research it. An hour before your class, I got my answer because I called the supplier. I says, tell me all about these regulators and how they can be interchanged and so forth. He says, well, of course. He says, he says, when you buy a nitrogen regulator and an oxygen regulator, he says it's the same regulator, same identical high pressure regulator. But one has got a fitting for the nitrogen and one has got a fitting for the oxygen. He says, but we sell adapters. And you can take your oxygen regulator that you bought, and if you have a nitrogen tank, put the adapter on there and use it on your nitrogen tank. And if you got a nitrogen regulator and you don't have one for the oxygen tank, put the adapter from there and you... Realize what's happening? If somebody has to blow out a system, I'm frightened today, and I don't know how to address this except to tell you and put it on video, that you are capable of taking your oxygen tank now because maybe your nitrogen went low, and if you have an adapter, you can add, and you don't even need an adapter, you can actually change these regulators and screw them right into the fittings, but they have adapters to use one for the other. Now, if I want to blow out that system, I really can take my oxygen tank, and I can come over here and blow it out with that same regulator. This was not a concern in 19, before 1992, because we use refrigerant to blow them out. You see what I'm saying to you? And I don't know how or what to do about this at this point. There's other people who are more involved in this. There are, there are uh, tank associations. But I'm telling you this so you don't get dead. I mean, it's as simple as that. You don't make a, pro you, you don't make a problem for yourself, and you end up not being here anymore. Pass this on to the people that you work with. Make sure that they know the difference between the tanks and that they know that oxygen cannot be used. And that's why I showed you this tape. If, if you walk out of here with anything tonight, you know about this stuff right here, that you cannot use it to blow anything out in refrigeration. And that's all I know on it. Okay? It gave me goosebumps when the fireman told me that, and this gives me goosebumps as of an hour before your class today. Yes? Um, what about uh, new craze about carbon dioxide, using that? So, so, you, say you, mean, you mean CO2? Yeah, use yes, that. CO2 you can use also to blow things out, and we never used that stuff years ago. The problem with CO2 is that it's very moist. They're saying it's just as dry. I'm sorry? I, I heard in like a, I don't know, some kind well, of... And, and, and you might be right. You know, I'm only saying from lectures that I've heard. But CO2, you still got to evacuate. Oh, yes. And it's better, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Uh, compressed air would be would, could be wet, and again, I really don't know. I can't give you a good answer on that. It's a, which one is the is the best? But if you got the choice, you always use nitrogen to blow the system out. That's all that there is available, and you now know about the vacuum pumps and why you have to evacuate and so forth. Okay, all right. So we've done that. I got a two minute review. Then I ask you so, and you're going to pick on two people now, and then we're going to have two volunteers, and then we are over with. So in a quick review, we, we showed you a basic refrigeration system that was actually the, the, the very first page. You understand the component parts. The next page, we talked about um, uh, thermometers and the, the movement of molecules. And I want to know from you what was good for you to learn here tonight and that was good for you to take back. On page three, we talked about the definition of a BTU. The next page were the charts on density and specific heats. Uh, page five, we talked about heat transfer and gave you samples on page six. On page seven, we spent some time on the effects of latent and uh, sensible heat. We talked to you about the change of state. Page eight, we talked about mercury, atmospheric pressure. Page nine, uh, Rob cooked eggs on top of Mount Whitney. <laughs> page 10, we had the boiling point of water uh, with uh, uh, more and less pressure. Page 11, you learn how to use a pressure temperature chart. And then the next three pages were evaporators and condensers of uh, refrigerators and are nothing but air conditioners also. Um, when I get through with you, before I forget, and then again, before you leave, because I, I need four comments now before we finish this up. 
Uh, before you leave, then you fill out your evaluation. I do want you to put some comments down on there. I don't want you to say good, 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 you know, bad, bad, bad. Write something down that, that you like or something that you want to see improve, and you put it on the counter and flip it upside down. Put your envelope over there, too. Make sure we get that so you get your certificate. And that is going to pick on two people. I want to know what you learned here that was good, and then I want a couple of volunteers in it. So, Annette? Um, <coughs> And uh, him. Okay? <laughs> yeah, right. What did you learn that was good for you to learn tonight? Um, about the microns and the micrometer. I, uh, I've always done all my, all my personal stuff with the gauges, the regular gauges there. I'm going to check into that. That's, that's very good. Um, because we can be in this business for a long time, and I'm just like you. And it wasn't that long ago that I learned about microns, too, and I can pass it on to you. Mm -hmm. But now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's that's really a very good comment. Thank you. One more uh, person that you pick. Yeah. Who? Oh, Jan. Yeah. Okay. What did you learn? It's good for you to learn here tonight. A lot of just the basic theory. I learned a lot more than I learned in probably nine weeks of class so far. <laughs> <laughs> but any particular just, thing that was good? Just the common sense of the system and what's causing the problems. Basically.